we're ready to start. Good morning, the, the friends and uh, our speakers. I would like to invite you to the Sociological Study Presentation, Belarus and Poland, Lithuanian, Georgia, added to the war assistance to Ukraine and discrimination since the first day, 24th of February. As we know, Belarus became the uh, associate of, in the war and others became the representatives of the Belarusians became the representatives of the um, war and Belarusians in uh, Lithuania, Georgia and Poland uh, found themselves in hot water and uh, a group of independent sociologists with the help of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation researched the position of Belarusians in different countries. We have three parts to discuss here, the attitude to Belarusians who live in different countries, assistance uh, from Belarusians to Ukraine and Ukrainians, and uh, discrimination and bad attitude to Belarusians who live in dependent countries since the war in Ukraine broke out. The results of today will be presented by uh, Filip Dikanov, who is an independent sociologist, and uh, uh, Rigor, uh, Dr. Rigor Stapenia, director of the Center for New Ideas, head of the Belarusian Initiative Chatham House, Poland, will also take part in the discussion. Also, they will be joined by Natalia Ryabov, sociologist of Simple Bipart, and Vitis Yurkonius, political scientist. At the end of our meeting, we will be able to ask questions to the speaker, so please leave your questions and comments in the comment section. I would like to now give floor to uh, Christopher Ford, Forst, Director of Regional Office Dialogue in Ukraine and representative for Belarus. Thank you very much. Um, welcome also from my side to all our... Большое спасибо. Присутствует также с моей стороны всех наших гостей. Извините, что говорю по-английски. В моем случае сейчас я говорю из Белиси. Знание это действительно новая норма, как фонд Фридриха Эберта, старейший политический фонд Германии, прежде ценностям свободы, солидарности и справедливости. Мы рады поддерживать это исследование о белорусах Польши, Литве и Грузии. Как они видят войну в Украине, помогают украинцам и с какой дискриминацией они сталкиваются в знании из-за действий белорусского режима с 24 февраля. Мы сами, как представители фонда, имеем свой офис в Украине, и более половины нашей команды остаются там. 24 февраля, несомненно, изменила мир, и, несомненно, стала второй очень важной датой в новейшей белорусской истории после 9 августа 2020 года. В День независимости Украины я прочитал немало сообщений в соцсетях, в которых говорилось, по крайней мере, было 9 августа 2020 года, и нам не придется так стыдиться о роли Беларуси в войне, как это было бы в противном случае. Но в то же время режим играет свою роль в войне. Официальная Беларусь осматривается украинцами как соагрессор. Было проведено несколько опросов о том, как война формирует общественное мнение, восприятие режима и демократического движения внутри Беларуси. И, кстати, это отличный шанс прорекламировать другое издание, которое поддерживает наш фонд, в котором также участвует Филипп, а именно Беларусь Change Tracker. Так что погуляйте первое издание или следите за запуском второго издания в ближайшее время. Но исследования внутри Беларуси, конечно же, имеют свои ограничения. И, честно говоря, не всегда легко сказать, что делать с полученными результатами, учитывая крайне уровень репрессий. Но с несколькими сотнями тысяч белорусов игнания эта группа э, общества становится все более и более важной, пусть и по печальным причинам. Тем не менее, межстрановые анализы того, что думают белорусы в изгнании, практически отсутствуют. Исследования, которые мы сегодня предоставляем вашему вниманию, дают нам возможность понять это немного лучше. Э, провести такое исследование тоже непросто, и оно может иметь свои недостатки, как нам, конечно, объяснит Филипп, но оно все равно очень ценно и проводится в других условиях, чем, конечно, исследование в самой Беларуси. Я, конечно, уже ознакомился с исследованием и знаю, что выводы, хотя и неудивительно, с точки зрения их тенденций, в какой-то степени впечатляют в плане того, насколько едины белорусы в знании по определенным вопросам. Но есть и некоторые различия между странами, их тоже важно заметить. Особенно, когда речь идет о третьем из трех вопросов, которые рассматривают данное исследование, а именно о дискриминации, с которой сталкиваются белорусы в знании. Это можно сказать нам о том, в каких областях правительством и гражданам этих стран следует пересмотреть свой подход. В целом, Результаты этого исследования могут быть полезны для самих акторов из этих стран, будучи выходцем из Германии. Я могу сказать, что мне даже немного жаль, что Германия не была включена в исследование, чтобы мы могли использовать его для создания определенного политического давления на немецких партнеров. Но они могут быть наиболее полезны для белорусов, а именно для демократических сил, независимых НГО или независимых СМИ. Все еще помнят, например, компанию «Саша 3%». 
but here we have some as representative as it gets under these conditions numbers, some of which uh, are very impressive and they may be very useful to highlight where Belarusians abroad stand on the war in Ukraine, how many of them are helping Ukrainians and in what areas they are facing war. And frankly speaking, we were actually ourselves also surprised by some of them, at least I was. Um, I can imagine that some of them may be quite impressive for the Polish, Lithuanian and Georgian public as well. We should certainly not forget that Belarusians in Poland, Lithuania and Georgia do not mirror the Belarusian society within the country perfectly. The public opinion there may differ quite a lot, but they are part of that society and not included in sociological research, which focuses on Belarusians and Belarus only. And they also build own communities in their countries, ideally temporarily, um, where they have relocated. So I'm very glad that we have some fresh data now to understand them a bit better. I hope it will be perceived as useful and may be used in some of the ways I've mentioned. I would very much like to thank the authors which have already been named for the extensive work. I'm looking forward to your presentation, Philip, and I would last but not least also like to thank my colleague uh, from AVS, Taras Michalniuk, who put in a lot of work in this as well, and of course, you, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Now we're moving to the presentation of the research, and I give floor to Philip Bekanov. Good afternoon. Good morning. I would like to thank you for the platform that you provided to us. Uh, turning on the presentation, I'll say a few words of gratitude towards the British uh, Foundation who supported our project. This is very important for us. I believe this research is one of the most uh, important pieces of research that I made in the last uh, months. As Christopher rightly said, the Belarusian diaspora fell out of focus of um, the majority of research researchers. Many researchers are concentrated inside of Belarus, particularly after the August of 2020. It's not particularly clear what is happening there. Uh, now you will be able to see my screen, the screen of my presentation. Before we start the presentation, I must say a few words about the authors of this research. Even though I'm presenting this to you today, I'm not the fully fledged author of the research methodology and uh, approach analysis of the Polish part of, of the research, because we cover Belarusians in three countries, Poland, Lithuania, and Georgia. So the Polish approach was developed by Alia Kalampiev, a brilliant researcher. Research on Georgia and Lithuania it was made by me. All these things aside, uh, we can start presenting. Uh, it's important to say that the presentation you see is uh, just a sample. Everything I say will be in the full version of the report. Which it will be sent to you today. I believe you will receive the link very soon. All the registered participants of today's event will receive it. Right, let's get to it. First, we need to talk about who were the people that we asked questions to. As Christopher rightly noted, we indeed have some issues connected with the data uh, collection approaches. Not, not in Poland, Lithuania, or Georgia, we have access to uh, a document or set of documents that would allow us to evaluate how many Belarusians live where, what uh, their education level is, what their age is. So basically to get the distribution based on the general approaches. Consequently, don't uh, have a possibility to build a, a sample based on this. So we had to use um, snowballing approach use the snowballing approach, uh, you, you working with the groups that have a high concentration of relicants, telegram chats, and so on. In Poland, we were greatly helped by Youth Hub. In Lithuania, we were helped by Budzma Belarusian. Belarusami in Georgia it was a snowballing effect. Strictly speaking, this sample indeed it does not correspond to the strict scientific approach. At the same time, we believe that uh, 
the real distribution are very much different from the data we received. Particularly, we see it in the example of Poland, and we think the same the same way about Lithuania and Georgia. So I believe that the answers we received to our questions were really up to date and true. We believe there's no correlation between the our our error percentage is small, and we uh, will we were using statistical methods as well. This is the most is, that is available to us. In Poland, we conducted the research one and a half months earlier, which means that figures in Poland are a bit different now. I think they have uh, gone up because the, from the point of view of discrimination, of course, because the questions we asked the people were about discrimination, were subjected to discrimination, and the number of people that face discrimination um, grows as time goes. So I believe that in Poland, the figures are a bit higher now these days than they were when uh, we wrote the, the research. We'll start by saying that Belarusians in Poland, Lithuania and Georgia are the Belarusians that do not support Alexander Lukashenko, do not support the government, the official government of Belarus. In Poland, Lithuania and Georgia after 2020, uh, went a lot of people who represent the opposition to the Lukashenko regime. There are virtually no people among them who supported in our survey, and uh, we don't have any reasons to believe that in Poland, Georgia, and Lithuania, there's a significant number of Belarusians who support Alexander Lukashenko or the official government of Belarus. The same way, we agree on the following, that uh, Belarusians uh, support a certain side in the war between Russia and Ukraine. There are almost no uh, Belarusians in those countries that would support Russia. There are a few people that told us they support neither side, but still uh, the biggest support is in favor of Ukraine among Belarusians in these three countries. We will further see how it, it is expressed, this support. It's important to note that the majority of the people, they blame, put the blame, in this conflict on Russia. At the same time, uh, there's a quite number of people that know that Belarus is also blame. People feel that uh, Belarus had its part in the beginning of the war. It's interesting to compare it with the results of other research that our colleagues conduct, like Dr. Rigor Astapeni, who will speak later. His team uh, found out that quite a few people in Belarus don't know that Belarus is involved in this war. It is, the situation with Belarusians abroad is better. There, I believe Rigor had about 20% of respondents agreeing that Belarus is a co aggressor, and in our research, we found that the, this number of Belarusians is bigger. Even though Belarusians blame Russia the most, they still understand that Belarus had its part. And we believe that our respondents who said that the United States and Western partners are to blame for war, uh, they just don't know much about uh, what is going on. So, uh, over 70% of, of Belarusians in each country, in Poland it's over 80%, took part in somehow helping Ukraine. What we mean here is this support is not virtual, is factual, is real. We see that in Poland, the 
leave the, the biggest number of Belarusians who helped Ukrainians because it's easier for Belarusians to help Ukrainians. There are more uh, refugees from Ukraine coming to Poland. According to the NDP report, it's the major country who received the refugees from Ukraine. What are the options of helping? These are meetings, manifestations, and the material support. Here we also um, ask questions about social networks, and we analyze the situation with people who would who are helping, particularly in social networks, like spreading information and the like, and by expressing their solidarity with Ukraine, but did not opt for anything else. Uh, there are a number of less than 2% of such people in each of the three countries. In other words, Belarusians who live in Poland, Lithuania and Georgia actually support Ukraine and are actively involved in different kind of activity. So Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees. In Poland, as we see, there are more of a direct assistance and support, like uh, giving food products and clothes to people, participation in the volunteering actions, and again, it, it, explained, it is explained by the fact that there are more opportunities for this assistance in Poland. Let's move to the second important topic that we will connect with the first topic later. It is discrimination. Belarus, just like Stasia rightly noted, has found itself in an unpleasant situation. Belarusians have found themselves involved in this situation by the government, by Russia, who is shelling Ukraine from the territory of Belarus and uh, moved into Ukraine from Belarus. It led to the worsening of attitude to Belarusians in Ukraine and in other countries. So we tried to measure how often Belarusians uh, saw and came across any manifestations of discrimination. We understand there is a certain limitation of rights present or possibilities. A person or a group of people could be discriminated against uh, by certain ways. We understand discrimination widely. We will later describe in detail what it is for us. But we considered several uh, certain structural sides to it, uh, like uh, rejection of employment, uh, and rejection of applicants for bank account, and negative attitude to Belarusians. What is important here, we asked uh, about personal experience and experience of friends and relatives. We see a certain pattern here. We see that in Lithuania, there's uh, less experience of coming across discrimination than it is in other two countries. The worst situation is in Georgia, where 40% of Belarusians have personal experience of coming across discrimination, being subjected to discrimination. In total, if we put together the personal experience and the experience of friends and relatives, because it forms the picture through which people see the world around them, we'll see that discrimination is just a part of the reality for the majority of Belarusians in Poland and in Georgia. In Lithuania, the situation is better. Why? We have a several thoughts about it, because in Lithuania, Belarusians live in Vilnius, the majority of them. It's a close-knit community that allows to stay inside, not go outside much. So being in Vilnius, you can communicate only in Belarusians. There are a lot of Belarusians these days living in Vilnius. Secondly, in Lithuania, as far as we understand, there's a more understanding of internal process and Belarusians and dynamics of 2020. Overall, there are fewer manifestations and in few, furthermore, further on, we will see how Lithuanians, fewer Lithuanians show a negative attitude to Belarusians. The situation in Georgia is a bit worse than Poland, but it's almost similar. 
What is discrimination? These are different things, like uh, verbal abuse, most of all, most often. We consider this as discrimination because we understand that this is quite a subjective um, point. Some people may think that they were not given a, an opportunity to rent a flat because they were Belarusians. Others believe that an experience of the people receive. So this information is also spread actively and this shouldn't be ignored. What are the main structural issues here? It's a rejection uh, to be served in the bank. It happened most often in Georgia. There were several media cases where Belarusian citizens were uh, considered the same way as the citizens of Russia and uh, they were not given an account in banks until they write certain, uh, sign a certain paper or just for no reason. Also, the majority is the biggest problem. The, the biggest problem in Lithuania is that Belarusians cannot get um, rent a flat, an apartment. The same is true in Georgia. Employment is the uh, situation is, uh, with employment of Belarusians is the worst in Poland because uh, there are a lot of Belarusians who uh, are not hired in high positions. They're not IT specialist. It's easier to come and uh, leave Pol come to and leave Poland and quite a lot of Belarusians face rejection to get employed. It was uh, it was actually discussed with the Polish trade union. This is unpleasant. In Georgia there are separate cases, a unique uh, case when Georgians learned that potential customers from Belarus, they increase the price for Belarusians. This is a unique approach. It cannot be found either in Lithuania and Poland. At the same time, uh, the employment rejection figures are very small in Georgia because it, Belarusians stay there in waiting for Polish visa. Because Belarusians don't believe that Georgia is the final destination point. What nationalities are discriminating against Belarusians? Just like the locals and Ukrainians, they discriminate against Belarusians in Poland. In Georgia, there are fewer Ukrainians, so the number of people who discriminate against Belarusians is fewer. In Lithuania, the situation is as follows. The more Ukrainians there are in, in one of these countries, the, the more Belarusians face, dis Belarusians face discrimination against them. We, of course, asked our respondents whether this discrimination is a big of a problem for them. The results are quite interesting. We see that there are two expected results that in Poland the percentage of discrimination is quite high and the problem is quite acute. In Lithuania uh, the figure is quite low, so it's not much of a, much of a problem. And in Georgia the, the percentage is high, but the uh, assessment is on the par with Lithuania because Georgia is seen, as I said, as a temporary point. So, uh, Belarusians are not affected by structural problems in Georgia. They believe they would leave Georgia soon, looking for a job somewhere else in the near future. Besides, in Georgia there are fewer Ukrainians, and people who face discrimination from, on the part of Ukrainians, they assess the discrimination problem in a more significant way than those that face discrimination from the locals. Uh, 
It has to do with the fact that the people that Belarusians are less tolerant to discrimination from Ukrainians, coming from Ukrainians. Um, when it comes to locals, Belarusians say it's fine, but when it comes from Ukrainians, uh, Belarusians find it uh, really unpleasant and painful because almost every Belarusian living in these three countries is supporting Ukraine in this or that. Uh, matter and they all are against the war in Lukashenko. So they really take it to heart. Probably this also explains the situation in Georgia in this respect. And in conclusion, I may say that even though discrimination is a part of reality for majority of Belarusians living in all the countries except Lithuania. Even those who face discrimination personally, including from the side of Ukraine, the majority of them are planning to continue support and help Ukraine in this or that way. As we saw, this assistance is real. It's not only some words written in social networks, social feeds, there's some tangible things. The people who are not ready to do this, there are very few of them, less than 10%. And then the biggest number figure is 8%. So the norm for Belarusians in Poland, Lithuania, and Georgia is providing assistance to Ukrainians, even though they face discrimination from the locals or from Ukrainians themselves. I will soon uh, give floor to my colleagues. Belarusians in Poland, Lithuania, and Georgia do not support Lukashenko or his actions that are against Lukashenko and his government. It would be great if we did not have the same approach to all Belarusians, because if Belarusians are in Lithuania, Poland, and Georgia, there's a very big chance that uh, they're very much different to Belarusians who should be punished for the actions of the Lukashenko regime. Belarusians is in these three countries, they support Ukraine. It is a norm for them. They support Ukraine. They help Ukraine. Belarusians help Ukraine despite being discriminated against. Just even though discrimination became part of the social reality of the life of Belarusians, and we need to do something about it. Some advocacy, advocacy measures uh, should be very much in place here. Okay, that's it from me. I would like to give floor to my colleagues. Stasia would like to thank everyone for their attention. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. It would be interesting now to hear the commentary from experts. And the first to speak will be uh, Regora Stapeni, who is uh, the director of the Center for New Ideas, head of the Belarus Initiative Chatham House. Good morning, good day, everyone. Thank you, Philip and Oleg, for their research. I believe this research could be a great tool for advocacy, for advocating for uh, interests of Belarusians living abroad. While Philip was speaking, I was taking notes. So I'll use them in order to comment on the presentation of Philip, leaving my commentary and remarks. Well, I start by saying that uh, discussing the sample and the diaspora, the number of immigrants. I think this is the most important point that needs to be understood. I mean, the number of Belarusians who live abroad now. How big this number is and how big the diaspora is. There's still immigrants, but there are lots of big groups of them. There are tens of thousands of people there, over 100,000 people. So this is important to note in order to understand, to be able to 
uh, say how important the attitude of these people is. It's also important to note here uh, how well developed the infrastructure is, uh, infrastructure supporting Belarusians. The fact that they can advocate for the changes in discrimination practices is also paramount. I uh, have been living in Poland for a while, and I know there's quite a lot of cases of discrimination, mostly happening in Warsaw. Still, there are quite a few of them, and you always know that you will get help, which will help you to speak in one voice. Also, I wanted to ask a question about help to Ukrainians. I have a project running in parallel, and I wanted to steal an idea from your project in, for mine. My question is whether you found, together with Oleg, some things that describe which parts of assistance Belarusians choose or opt for. Because I saw it in Poland, in several families, I saw that Belarusians sent money to the account of the armed forces of Ukraine, and uh, females that went to the train stations to volunteer. Several families of Belarusians did that. So I was wondering if it's a general trend that is conditioned by uh, demographical figures. Also, I wanted to note about the discrimination, because when we think about it, when we talk about it, I think the most important thing here is to help the most vulnerable people and groups because losing a job and have uh, employment figures, employment problems for people is a big problem. How these issues need to be tackled the most actively. I know that people got rejected uh, for some employments because they were people be Belarus. I know that those Belarusians were not particularly well off, and this is a major problem for them. So it's important to raise this issue, even though in social feeds there were lots of lots of. Uh, discussions about, you know, who was against whom and some quarrels there, but uh, I think we'll, very soon everyone will understand that Belarusians living in those countries do not support the war. So it's important to concentrate on the groups of people who are the most vulnerable and for whom discrimination is the biggest threat. Probably the last thing I wanted to say is about recommendations. If Belarusian diaspora is as big as it is now for a long time in abroad and will constantly find itself in a situation where it's held responsible for the actions of the Belarusian regime, in the eyes of the locals and Ukrainians, it's important to advocate to show the people that we are different. We do not support Lukashenko and his regime. Well, I will stop here. Thank you very much to the researchers and authors of the research. It was interesting to learn about it. Thank you, Rehor. Philippe, maybe you have some commentary or have some feedback. Well, I probably can say a few words about the differences. I totally agree with what Rehor said about the sample. Nobody knows the figures, the exact figures of people who left Belarus for these three countries. It's impossible for us to build a super robust model that we can analyze them. But we do what we can in terms of social demographic figures. Indeed, there's a number of differences that we discovered, but we decided not to focus 
primarily on them, or solely on them, because we did not believe it was particularly important to understand how, how actually males and females, men and women, help Ukrainians, because we were talking about discrimination on the whole. Indeed, women more often provide some uh, volunteering services and give clothes and uh, men usually donate money and uh, women usually write more in social feeds these are the major differences here in terms of age differences I'm not sure I because I don't have figures at the top of my head I will, again I uh, don't see the major importance here attached to it. On the whole, Belarusians do help. I mean, the majority of them do help Ukrainians. There's no much. There's no such difference that Belarusian men they sit on the, sit on the couch and those women go and provide volunteering services. Seventy-five percent of Belarusians are involved in helping Ukraine, and uh, if there is a five percent margin here, it's not that important. I agree totally with your words about advocacy measures. Thank you very much, Philip. I would like to give floor to our next speaker, sociologist and expert of the simple bipart, Natalia Ryabova. Thank you very much for this presentation. I, uh, when I saw the text for the first time, I was eager to read the full uh, report. It was interesting for me to see what's the difference. Before I uh, saw the results of this research, I thought that Belarusians in these three countries will be will face different circumstances. Uh, however, I was surprised uh, to see that the situation is very much similar. I thought it would be much more different. In terms of my feedback about the Georgian part of this research, they will be as follows. I don't agree uh, with the interpretation that uh, Belarusian uh, immigrants they see don't see Georgia as the final destination point and uh, thus they are not interested in uh, not by discrimination they don't want to get employment indeed there are a number of people who view Georgia in this respect particularly when the war started many people wanted to leave for Europe they didn't have visas so they moved to Georgia where they tried to get a visa which is not so easy and they moved to uh, the EU. Still, there are a number of people, and I think this group is much bigger than those uh, or, uh, stay in Georgia temporarily, who consider Georgia to be their final destination point, or at least uh, they open businesses, small businesses like cafes, and uh, they open non NGOs here. Georgia is represented by about 100 organizations that were closed at some point in the past in Belarus. In this uh, way or another, they are now registered, registered in Georgia and work there. People buy real estate in Georgia, I mean, Belarus. So we cannot say that uh, this big diaspora sees Georgia as a temporary location. I find uh, the figure of 2% of Belarusians who rejected employment explained is the, by the fact again that Belarusians came here to parallel. Again, this is explained that by the fact that NGO representatives in IT Experts come to to Georgia with their own employment. I mean, they don't have to get registered. Business, some businessmen open their businesses. They freelancers. They open long distance. They work for each other. So very few people try to get the local employment in Georgia without knowing the German language. And so these figures is quite small, and rightly so. In terms of uh, rejection of uh, apartment. Uh, renting and uh, opening an account. It, indeed, it was a problem, particularly regarding the uh, um, rental 
apartments and flat, there were a huge number of uh, people, uh, particularly young, team, young males who flooded Georgia in the first days and weeks of war because they were afraid of the draft. So the local Georgians, they were trying to, some of them were rejecting uh, such males. And it's important to note that for Georgians, it's a personal trauma regarding Russia because about 20% of Georgia is occupied by Russia. So when the new uh, military aggression started and uh, Belarusians uh, in the eyes of the, uh, some Georgians were again had their part played in this. The attitude of the locals was as it was. I think it has subsided, it's gone down, but uh, it's still there. What else I wanted to say? I wanted to comment the fact that uh, the finding that discrimination problem is not particularly acute for Belarusians living in Georgia. It is explained by the fact that uh, while in Lithuania and Poland, these issues, I mean, the legalization issues, and without the uh, ID number and the visa, you cannot do much. In Georgia, as you know, you can live without the uh, temporary employment at, and uh, w without the uh, uh, temporary uh, res residence permit. So if the people don't get this residence permit, it's fine for them. They can live on and work there. I mean, in Georgia. So considering all these Belarusians in Georgia don't see the discrimination issue as acute as Belarusians in Lithuania and Poland. Also, I had uh, quite a few questions uh, that don't have answers. For example, like how often Belarusians in these three countries see each other, what they think about each other. I know that you don't have answers to these questions in this research, even though I find these questions quite interesting. Also, the number of Belarusians living in these three countries is also very interesting for researchers. These are the main uh, commentaries and my main feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Philip was actually reacting to your words. I was, yes, I was mostly agreeing to what Natalia was saying. I'm not an expert on Georgia, therefore we, we sent uh, our work to Natalia for feedback so that we could see where we could uh, misinterpret some data. I totally agree that the Russians mostly bring their jobs with them to Georgia. In many ways, it explains the importance of discrimination, how it's perceived. So, Belarusians feel themselves fine in terms of um, money in influx. I mean, uh, employment in Georgia, they don't feel that much discriminated. Again, the full version of the text says something about 2020 and situation then, but it's, it will be marked there. Again, I totally agree with what Natalia said about the questions that didn't have answers. And we'll do our best to somehow calculate the number of people, the number of Belarusians who left Belarus for these three countries and who live now, who now reside there. I uh, believe that we'll try to do this in, in the upcoming months. Thank you, Philip. I would like to give floor to Vitya Sirkonis, political scientist, head of the Freedom House in Lithuania. Good morning, thank you very much for this research. It is very interesting. It's great to see some figures showing that Lithuania compared to other countries uh, looks a bit better. Although I agree that with researchers saying that this there are some reasons for that, that they told us about. Let's uh, now be more concrete and discuss certain points. I saw some issues with the visa support. 
Lithuania was the first country or one of the first countries that provided to the Russians. So Lithuania has been helping, is helping, will be helping the repressed representatives of the Belarusian civil society. This is not changing, even though in the last several weeks or months we see some competition here in terms of various official officials talking about the visa restrictions. Uh, we see that non-politicians, non-journalists, people who don't know much about the difference between Schengen and national visa, they comment on this. And I hope that this is not seen and of course, we'll talk more about perception later on. There is some discrimination based on the passport. But I also believe that all this talk that we have today about it boils down to much simpler things like the PR. And I definitely don't want uh, to see discrimination towards Belarusians based on their passport. Secondly, the war actively changed the status quo. The wave of Russian migrants is changing the landscape of mig migration. Moreover, there was a influx of refugees from the Middle East artificially created by the Belarusian regime in 2021. We all remember that, I believe. At the same time, the expectation that the issue of Belarusians will be number one on the agenda, as it was in 2020, should not be expected. No, Ukraine is the number one issue on the agenda, and this is normal. I mean, now, moreover, if we look at the Eastern Partnership Framework, the Association Agreement and the like, it's clear that the Belarusians compared to Ukrainians, despite the good attitude, uh, have the Belarusian passport, and Ukrainians will find it a bit easier in this respect, because they have biometrical passports, and we need to consider the agreements that were signed between Ukraine and, say, Lithuania. So, it should be surprising that the attitude towards Ukrainian is a bit better in this respect, because uh, they are, first of all, they were the target of the aggression, and they were subject to, to war. Even though I believe it would be, was rightly noted that Lithuania understands very well the situation and negative situation in Belarus as well. The third point is discrimination. And we need to set aside the discrimination and this perception and the discrimination itself, I mean, the fact of discrimination. I can give you a simple example. Compared to the refugees from Middle East, I mean, what happened in 2021 is still continuing. The discrimination of Belarusians is, is very small. Uh, with all the due respect, it's important sometimes to compare such things to understand. Some say that the Belarusians are closer to us and, uh, but the rights for migrants or refugees, despite the ethnic ethical differences and religion, they should be the same. And the fourth point, which is very important, and I raise this issue quite regularly, the main task, both in Lithuania and in Brussels, in Georgia as well, in, uh, in Germany as well, sorry, for people who understand what is happening. It's important not to bring out all the Belarusians away from Belarus and provide safe conditions for them, but it's important to create 
uh, conditions for them to return at some point in the future. So it's our task is not to go back to the same that happened in 2020. And uh, uh, Dr. Astapenia said, said the right thing about the self-regulation. I think there should be more of this. I don't fully agree with the conclusions of the research. They say that the issues need to be tackled through advocacy measures and some media agenda alone. In other words, I do I understand that there could be a quick fix seen in, by many people. For example, if we talk about the lodgings and the flats and apartments that, that have a price set tags these days, you can advocate as much as you want. The prices will be getting higher. The Venus is not unlimited in space. Not only Belarusians feel it, other migrants feel it including the people of Berlin, I mean, the residents of Vilnius. When we talk about the bank accounts, I try as, do, uh, I, as hard as I can as, and talk about that, raise this issue as much as I can, discuss it with the agencies. But we need to understand the issue of compliance. And we need to understand the residents of the third countries, not only Belarusians or Russians. We don't want to compare Russians or, with Belarusians, but let's say, Americans or Azerbaijani citizens, if they don't have a residence permit, they face the similar issues. The issue of opening a banking account or, or making transfers, money transfers from the United States and US dollars are cashing in money and sending the money to third countries. So there's a uh, compliance measures that reflect that the uh, money laundering uh, issues that uh, took place in Estonia, in Latvia, and in some in the past in Lithuania. And I believe the compliance measures uh, should be tough, but uh, I also understand that persons should be helped in this respect. I think Lithuania, in this respect, made uh, quite a lot of steps in terms of issuing national visas and simplifying the residence permit acquisition, a humanitarian corridor and assistance for journalists and so on. That helps people to settle down and open an account. But even the government somehow cannot tell the local banks and the majority of such banks to order them to open accounts to, for this or that person. So, uh, of course, this issue is quite sensitive for Belarusians. It's particularly sensitive for Belarusians these days, but unfortunately, this is not so easy to tackle. Not, not easy to solve, considering the number of uh, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians who have moved in Lithuania. So I believe uh, that, however, I agree with the majority of conclusions of this research. I found it very interesting. I understand that it would be great to, to see the differences between the people who came uh, to Lithuania and to such countries uh, through the local re relocation channels and those who came uh, through humanitarian channels. Because they have different level of uh, life. They see some things in the same way and others in a different way. So it will also be interesting to see how this issue with bank accounts and lodgings will be sold. And it's interesting to see how people, Belarusians who came to Lithuania before 2020 who did not suffer from repression then how they face this discrimination issue. Again, I and I hope this issue will be raised further on.
more research will be done in this respect, and it will be very beneficial to Lithuanian agencies and authorities as well. The last thing that should, that should be considered is that in Lithuania, but tens of thousands of Belarusians came to Lithuania. The people, the number of people who deal with the Belarusian issues is limited by tens of people. So each Belarusian, when this self regulation kicks in, Belarusian faced difficulties in this respect. The number of people who need to tackle this issue should increase. I know that there was research by a number of NGOs and the compliance issues were there before the war and before 2020. Thank you very much. Vitis, I see Natalia Rabo raising hand. Would you like to comment? Something. I, mean, something. I would like to say what I forgot to say. It's also interesting to learn how the diasporas work internally, how they communicate with each other. But it's also interesting for me to learn more about the trends of diasporas. Um, flowing inside of Belarus and outside Belarus. Because in Georgia, that has a diaspora of mostly represented by male IT specialists. Shows that some of them not only move further on to Europe, but also move back to Belarus. So they left Belarus due to sanctions use some general discomfort and comfortable measures, but some of them go back to Belarus. And I think this presents some interest to researchers, should present some interest to researchers. Thank you, Natalia. Philip? Commenting on what is happening inside diasporas, I must say that we'll uh, talk further about this. As, as for the Vitis Yurkonis, I believe Vitis is one of the few people who really understand what is happening with Belarusians in Lithuania and who helped that much, who helped Belarusians in Lithuania that much. For me, I see a big issue in what you say. Uh, for me as a sociologist and as a researcher, I my desire to be as objective as possible, I mean, as a researcher. And uh, the fact that I am a Belarusian uh, in exile myself. So this is a uh, two interests that fight with, with each other. It's a conflict of interest. It's important to recognize that I'm not 100% unbiased when I conduct this research. I cannot uh, disengage here. And uh, Vitis can do this. So I cannot use such uh, categories to talk about such issues. So I cannot compare myself with Syrian refugees. I don't think it's relevant. Maybe from the long distant distance positivist point of view, this is a right approach, but people who, are, who are, whom are analyzed, they suffer right now. And my research has one of its aims to put focus on that, put the, put, put uh, the suffering on the spotlight, in the spotlight. I understand that uh, what you said, which is about Ukrainians and their importance. But at the same time, discrimination is not only about uh, some um, compliance measures of the banks and the uh, red tape machine 
malfunction in Lithuania. There is some experience of Belarusians in Lithuania and Poland and in Georgia. They feel themselves much less in security and safety than they did before 24th of February 2022. At the same time, these Belarusians Oh, well, actually, the same is true about Lithuanians. Well, I understand, of course, I understand. I agree with you here. There's a, always a military threat that we uh, all need to consider from the side of Russia. If I was a representative of the Baltic states, I would be very much afraid of my independence and sovereignty. But apart from this military threat, okay, okay let's talk about the uh, Panivieja's students. We'll see that uh, this person will not find a place to live when they want to study. And it's uh, obvious. So let's, let's not uh, view it not only from our point of view, but also have a much wider view. We need to understand that everyone faces this. Everyone comes across this issue. Only because you speak Russian doesn't mean that you will not get a flat. It does happen. And some people may say some. they will not give you a flat or apartment because you're from Belarus, you speak Russian. And some Ukrainians, even Ukrainians, face this uh, discrimination when they spoke Russian among themselves. They were told to go to Russia, and Ukrainians had to say that they were from Mariupol. So the tensions are running high. That's why the researchers and human rights lawyers need to bring down their emotions and to look at this um, wider, from a wider angle. I totally agree with that. At the same time, there are things that uh, could be solved uh, using the advocacy measures. Like in Poland, for example, uh, some people who don't pro they reject Belarusians, I mean, do not give them employment, probably don't understand the difference between the Belarusians living in Poland and Belarusians living in Belarus. And the space for, or room for advocacy is still there. We need to increase the awareness raising approaches. We need to establish more context between the Belarusian diaspora and the Ukrainian diaspora and others. We don't have much to argue about here with you. I totally agree with what you say. It's just uh, I believe that there are things that uh, could be issues that could be solved with little effort. And need, this needs to be done. And it very much linked with the awareness raising measures. Christopher, you wanted to say something? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> All right. Um, just uh, very briefly, actually, I want to make a point against the the separation of groups. Um, and I agree that, I mean, I'm also right now in Georgia, and I agree that there may be a bigger tendency here of people who go back and forth, and I also know quite a few, so this, uh, this is uh, probably a realistic Um, is it us? And how the human rights situation of people is in this study sorry, here. We, we, sorry, sorry, we lost you. We lost you for like last thirty seconds. If you could go over once again, you, your internet failed. I'm sorry. Uh, am I back? I guess. Am so. I back? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Now it says that my internet connection is unstable. So if I disappear again, then just go on without me. But anyways, uh, so. Um, I just wanted to say that 
Uh, I actually disagree with the point of separating groups. I find it important to have these four or five percent of people who do not say that they would clearly say it's either Russia or Ukraine that's mainly responsible for the war. It's important to admit that they exist. And I also there are so many people in Georgia who are um, in this in-between group um, that the that the um, findings in Georgia did not differ so much from the findings in Poland and and Lithuania. So um, I think for for our purpose here, for for the research interest we're having here to to analyze how the how the diaspora is is viewing the war in Belarus, how it's supporting Ukrainians, and what sort of uh, repercussions it feels uh, from the war. I find it very important to regard this as as one group of Belarusians who had to leave the country and and not separate it further. There may be other sort of questions uh, that you ask where where this may be a, a, an appropriate approach. But here I'm actually glad that we took this holistic picture and it really tells us a lot. Thank you, Christopher. Um, mis misinterpreted in some way. I never proposed to you know to separate these people. I mean, uh, no, no, I wasn't referring to you, Philip. I was sorry. responding to the yep. chat and to, to remarks before. Thank you very much, Christopher. We can start the Q and A session already. Um, one of the most important questions is when we'll be able to get hold of the full research, full text. Let's repeat it, the colleagues from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung will post the Russian and English version on their website. All the registered participants of today's presentation will receive a link to this to full report. What I showed you is not a, it's a a brief version. I wouldn't be able to cover it in, in 15 minutes. All the registered users, the participants will receive within a week. I think. Uh, yes, yeah, just very briefly. Um, usually, it should be uh, online today. It's not fully uh, in in our hands because we sent it yesterday to a digital library because there were some corrections to be made. So it should usually be online today, and then we can send it out to everyone in Russian. Uh, if it takes till Monday, uh, don't be worried. Then you get it on Monday, and the English version uh, definitely within the next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to note one of the commentaries. So, uh, more of a remark from Anais Marie, who adds to what we just said that indeed those should be separated from uh, Belarusians who come through the IT channels and the humanitarian corridor who run away from repression because they face different models of threats and uh, different opportunities of getting legalized and or going back. So did you consider the differences between such groups? Without a doubt, we have a good representative sample in Poland. The Youth Hub did their job very well in asking questions. Uh, and the more for Belarusians going to Poland, not only rep repressed people and IT specialists, but many people go to Poland uh, through working channels. As far as I understand, the researchers uh, did not separate them. It wasn't our task. Our task was to understand whether Belarusians are subjected to discrimination and how they perceive and different issues like support of Lukashenko, attitude to war, support to Ukraine, how it corresponds with the discrimination experience. So we did not separate the political migrants from, let's say, IT specialists and others. It is without a doubt an important topic for future research. 
if we want to go deeper. But uh, not only IT uh, guys and only political migrants uh, come to Poland and other countries. Simple people they face the same structural issues. People who have a few high-tech skills may face the same problems or even worse problems compared to those uh, who are political migrants or IT specialists. I don't agree with uh, that. Working in Belarus Hub, we noticed that. We see that the cultural issues are the major ones. And uh, let's say they face the most of most discrimination, discrimination the most, I mean, the cultural activists. please. I'm going to see if there is some, they received feedback from Anais. I know that it's important to separate the groups. It's important to note, however, that the part of the IT relicants left Belarus because they were subject to repression. Particular employers or employees so it's not only about business that they left due to the worsening of business conditions, but because of the, again, they're also under repression. The people who had uh, criminal cases started against them found it more difficult to get leg legalized in these three countries compared to highly skilled workers. I don't think it's the same in Lithuania because we have a simplified residence permit acquisition approaches and this human uh, defense channel and every person who wishes to and has documented threats against them can receive this protection and this is very important to know that when we talk about discrimination and uh, the perception of discrimination, since the beginning of the war, we saw, we've seen a big flood influx uh, of uh, visa. Uh, of, of uh, young people who wanted to get a visa, who wanted uh, to avoid being drafted into the army. And this issue is important for Belarusian human defense lawyers, how to deal with that, but the, such people don't have a clear-cut threats against them. There are some fears on their part, and there are also third part third countries. I will agree with Natalia, who said that Georgia is not always a temporary location. People go there because there are no visa limitations. There are other countries where one can relocate if uh, they're not under con concrete threats, but uh, they're afraid of getting uh, discriminated against and uh, other things. Otherwise, we put everyone in one place, all Belarusians. And in the chat, there were lots of questions about visa support. When the competition about visa support began, and the people, when their voices appeared, that Belarusians or Russians should be banned from getting visas. There are also people who said that uh, all Belarusians should get five-year visas and Baskisensky comes to Germany 
and uh, people see him there and say he, people like him should not get visas. And we should understand whether you know KGB guys should get visa or not. I mean, did, we need to consider things like whether they worked uh, in the KGB in 2020 or they stopped working in 2019. So um, we need, need to understand who is good, who is bad here. I'm not talking about the passports of good, bad Belarusians, but the self-regulation process should be in place. Investigative journalists should be there. There should be a database of people who support uh, help the Russian regime do the, its awful things. And uh, this is a lot of work that needs to be done by the representatives of the civil society. We talk about tens of thousands of people uh, who needs to be analyzed. So I believe the third countries needs to be helped in this respect to sift Belarusians through. Thank you very much. There was another question whether there was a difference between immigration flows before 2020 and after 2020. Thank you for this question. Indeed, we did check this. We understand that more people Oh, you mean before 2020 and after 2020? Yes, indeed. Uh, we thought about that. We asked our respondent when they got in Poland or Georgia. We uh, didn't see any trends there, particular trends. The figures are the same. The only difference is when is about the countries they came to. Georgia was a destination more often after the war and Poland before the war. I mean the beginning of the war. For the full-scale invasion. Well, we're out of questions anyway, and uh, we have one commentary uh, left which says that in Georgia, People are rejected from getting a, a flat, not only or apartment, not only because of some nationality, because because Georgians are afraid of uh, special services guys getting those flats. Indeed, there were cases like this, and there were rumors like this. I don't know if you're interested in uh, learning more about rumors, but there were rumors that uh, Russia was planning to. Uh, invade Georgia the way it did Ukraine, so they're sending in special forces guys and uh, like spies who, in groups. Uh, so there was a rumor that was uh, discussed by realtors and private chats. But there was a historical way of such. Uh, commentaries just when, the, when just when the war started. Indeed, however, uh, there are people who reject potential uh, uh, dwellers on account of their nationality, whether they're Russian or Belarusians. I would like them to thank all the experts, viewers, and participants of today's discussion. We're nearing the end of our discussion. There was also a question from Vitaly, I think, or several of them. It's more of a pro was more of a proposal, I think. Vitaly raised his hand. I'm sorry. I, uh, Vitaly is not a participant, is he? Hello, uh, thank you for, for the research. I wanted to make two remarks. First, it uh, would be great. Research on the discrimination issue would be important to correlate it and compare it with the number of the people uh, who came to such countries because I believe in Poland has 
the discrimination issue against Belarusians is because the, there's also a big number of Ukrainians. And Belarusians need to compete with Ukrainians uh, with, when they want to put up their child in the kindergarten. So in Georgia and Lithuania, there were fewer Ukrainians in terms of, I mean, proportionally. Secondly, it's important in the future to uh, understand what is the discrimination or support of Belarusians from uh, the side of the government. What we are witnessing now is that on, on the initiative of the Baltic states at the Council of Ministers meeting, there will be a compromising option approved that and Belarusians will face visa difficulties. In the past, che, the Czech Republic and Lithuania were the at the forefront of lobbying the rights of Belarusians. Now these countries and their governments and we need to separate them from the civil society. Now they are provo proponents of discrimination. And this is not the first step from Lithuania. Unfortunately, there, there are no documented research of this kind. For example, limitations of, of uh, bringing cash money, like 80 euros, was introduced 18 months ago. Now there's a... Pro uh, the propositions to limit visa issues. Prime Minister of Lithuania, name Belarus, Belarus next to Russia. In the past, it was the same uh, approach from the Kremlin, and Landsbergis has the same approach now. In terms of, of the approach, don't you feel the cognitive dissonance when Vitis Yurkonyuk says that we need in the same way to treat the same way Arab, Arabs, I mean uh, migrants from Middle East and the Belarusians. At the same time, the Lithuanian government wants to limit the visa issues, not only for the Arabs, but for Russians. So we see a fully fledged differentiated approach. I would recommend to human defense lawyers to learn more about the approaches of Port Portugal, let's say, who did the same for two Latin American countries who have uh, visa-free access to EU. They had a um, close relationship with these such countries and there were more connections with them between Portugal and those Latin American countries, even though the EU was against at first. So I believe this trend needs to be researched further and also I believe that apart from uniting diasporas, we need to cooperate more with uh, um, human defense organizations. In Poland, the problem is that is in opposition to to the acting government, it will be perceived negatively. But on the whole, I think this needs to be paid more attention to, and uh, this should be a differentiated approach to Belarusians. Because I believe the Polish government in, is introducing now the simplified approaches to GIS receiving the work permit and residence permit. Another two points are important. I know at least 10 people who had their bank accounts closed in Lithuania after the war broke out. I don't know such examples in Poland. So let's not say this was always there. It was true about Lithuanian banks and Swedish banks. And secondly, in terms of humanitarian visas. Again, it's an important message for researchers. We need to focus not only on migrants, but also on people who are living in the country because some discrimination conditions are true about them. In terms of humanitarian visas, an activist of ours was rejected two times. She had a humanitarian visa. For a year, she did not leave the country, and she was actually working in the country. And then, on formal reasons, she was rejected by the embassy. Only on the, th the third time, she received a visa through our effort. 
So let's be honest. If Belarusians don't get an opportunity to open a visa D, uh, the type D visa, humanitarian visa don't solve the issue 100%. There's a great field of research, at least in as far as the actions of the governments are concerned. I uh, see that BTS is ready to respond. I'm not ready to assess the words of Landsbergis. I know that the tourist visas were not issues for a long time. It looks strange, but I'm not an expert here. But I will comment your remarks about our research. Indeed, we established this connection. We didn't do any statistical analysis, but we saw a different number of Ukrainian refugees in three countries has a difference in perceiving Belarusians as well. But again, as I say, Belarusians feel much worse when discriminated by Ukrainians than by locals. In terms of government agencies, I agree with you that that would be a great topic for a separate research. We don't have such tasks. We didn't have such tasks this time. We wrote a little bit about this. We should, could, have been, could have written more, but that wasn't the focus of our research. As far as the Portugal is concerned, or Lithuania is concerned. I, uh, I hope there will be a middle ground found. I don't think the visa, type D visa issuance is uh, currently discussed. Well, I'm sorry to for button in, but this is a real message that is sent. This is a real case of discrimination, because in the past, Czech Republic was uh, thinking of uh, banning those students from studying in Czech Republic. But the worsening conditions when extra conditions for issuing visas will be soon uh, reviewed by uh, EU officials. I think Vitis should respond to that because I didn't see that. The only message that I saw is that it, we stop issuing tourist visas and we continue issuing humanitarian visas. I didn't see anything other than that. This is uh, enough for fees, of course, but I'm not an expert here. This is a typical case when people when people uh, spread a disinformation. Because if we go deeper in this, uh, we'll see that it was clearly said there's no tourism. No, no visa for tourists, uh, only visas for repressed people. Many say the tourist visas are like Schengen visas, but it's not the case. Schengen visas are issued on uh, different occasions, just like tourist visas. But what we want to avoid is that uh, tourism is the number one reason for people to come. Uh, and this has been in place since the beginning of the war. The family issues, the relative issues, this is not an issue of tourism. If somebody together joins Anais Marin to participate in a certain presentation in Geneva, this is not a tourism. We need to separate those things. National visas uh, cover students, seasonal workers, people who came uh, through human, human rights channels. The only problem here is that there should be a pause between such visas, like of six months. And sometimes people wait for their visas for a long time. 
because there are third countries. If situation is bad, really bad in a concrete case, or situation is but doesn't have uh, is not openly persecuted, they can get visa in, in a third country. And this is done uh, as an exception for Belarusians because they uh, have to turn, they are supposed to turn for visas, apply for visas and they're in their respective countries. Natalia, like nobody else, knows uh, about the huge number of Belarusians applying for visas, Lithuanian visas in Georgia. When, but when you go to Lithuanian embassy in Minsk, you see the huge number of people who want to apply to visa there, even though there works only one diplomat. Visas are being issued there as well, in Minsk as well. So I, I don't think it's uh, we should fall for uh, hysterical voices in this respect and shouldn't pay much attention to what was done in Portugal. And, uh, you can come to our office and work for uh, and, and come there at 8 o'clock in the evening and see what kind of issues are is issued. And this hyster hysteria doesn't help. It get, it, the effect is adverse. We are busting our ass and, uh, and people are spreading disinformation. I think this is uh, wrong. This is biased. Right, thank you, uh, Vitis. I just wanted to say that the Germany and other countries that have the support, this, they also are against discriminating Belarusians in this respect. Colleagues, I think we should uh, have this discussion here and now. I don't think we'll get to the truth right here, right now. I believe we have uh, we are miscommunicating, and we don't have much time left. Considering the fact that uh, we're discussing the particular research, I think this topic is very hot and discussing the situation in various countries, how the legalization issues look like in this. These countries is a separate topic, the separate meeting is required to discuss that. So I'm glad that today we all gathered here and discussed the wonderful research and look, I look forward to receiving my copy to read, read in full. In the near future, everybody will receive their copies and will be able to evaluate it in full and discuss the results. I think that the, the results that show the attitude of Belarusians living abroad to the Russians in, Russian invasion in Ukraine, they are inspiring and show, they show that we're still together, we still uh, have a lot to do together, and we know where to move on. I would like to thank all the participants and the speakers. Philip, I would like to thank the Friedrich Abbott Stiftung for supporting this research. And uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, speakers, for participation, for their feedback and for their thoughts.